The holidays are a time to feel and create joy. And what could be more joyous than the look on her face as she unwraps a stunning new jewelry piece from Blue Nile? How about getting 50% off your purchase? Blue Nile offers premium quality, priced below traditional retail. Their online experts are available 24-7 to answer any questions and make sure you've picked the perfect gift. For a limited time, you can get 50% off at BlueNile.com. That's 50% off at BlueNile.com. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello, everyone. and Welcome back to this festive edition of Rival Recon here on Anfield Index Pro. I'm Harry Sethi. On today's show, we'll be diving into what's been a roller coaster 2023 for Burnley Football Club, with the club looking to begin a process of transformation under young manager Vincent Company. From the high of winning the title at Blackburn Rovers to the club's hard landing upon return to the Premier League, On today's show, we'll speak with Natalie Bromley from the No Nay Never podcast to get her perspective on why Burnley's return to the Premier League has proved so challenging, company's future at the club, and how Burnley can continue to develop over the coming seasons, both on and off the pitch. Welcome back, Natalie. Good to speak with you again. Yeah, good to be back. It's been a while. It's uh, yeah, it's it's one of those things, really. We had obviously an absence for a year away from the Premier League, so you didn't hear from any of us from a year. But yeah, it's. I'd like to say it's good to be back. I'm not entirely sure that that is true, but um, hey, yeah. I'm sure we'll come on to that. <laughs> yeah, no, we we definitely will. But before we get to any of that sort of cathartic chat, I, I did want to talk about. I mean, <laughs> the year as a whole, right? It's. I mean, there's sort of a roller coaster ride, I suppose, in terms of sort of that the. the the you know, great highs and then um, so, so some of the perhaps like, tough realities of life back in the Premier League at the moment. But I, I wanted to all go right the way back to um, the appointment of company, actually, back in 2022, uh, the decision for, you know, by Burnley to make that choice, to bring in you know, somebody who's still a novice manager, obviously st- still sort of building his his career as a manager, building his, his sort of philosophy, I suppose. Uh, yeah. a, big de- a big departure for the club, obviously having, having had so many years with with Deitch, who's whose you know, whose whose approach was quite well uh, understood by the end of his time at the club. But I want to ask you, I mean, um, it's a lot to cover, but I mean, like your thoughts when that appointment was first made, and then just sort of maybe talk about how he moulded the side uh, into uh, league winners last season. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sure. So I think I think first and foremost, it, it was a little bit of a roller coaster of emotions. We we got rid of Dash in the end of that season, which was absolutely the right time and the right moment to do so. Dash had come to an end of a chapter. I think he'd stopped being effective at what he did. Then I think it was I think it was an acknowledgement that the whole club needed a, a clear out from top to bottom. We got new owners, new management and coaching staff, and as it turns out now, an entire new squad of players. And everything has changed. Like the the landscape at Burnley, the club, the philosophy, the personnel is completely different to what everybody thought they knew about Burnley particularly in the the last 10 years now that's not to say that what we had under the Sean Dash years wasn't incredibly important and it played a really key part in where we've moulded as a business today Um, obviously we had an interim manager Mike Jackson took charge very nearly um, just kept us up there but Leeds pipped us the post on the last day of the season we went down at the time it was devastating because we genuinely were of the concern that clubs like Burnley only get one shot at the Premier League and once we came down again we don't necessarily have the resources or the <coughs> excuse me uh, or the capability to get back up again um, in the summer um, the board appointed Vincent Company. as soon as his name was mentioned as a possible candidate I said straight away he's the man I want and I think it's because I was so jaded with the old regime and I was so, it just felt, it felt very archaic was what we were, what we were trying to do at Burnley. That when company was appointed, it symboled to me a young manager, an exciting manager 
um, for Burnley, like for a club like Burnley, the first um, foreign manager and the first manager of colour, which is a really important milestone for me in terms of making the club more diverse and more um, welcoming of of all cultures and all nationalities and all you know multi faith disciplines. Absolutely. So yeah, and it, that was really important to me, and I and I think. You know, the the Brexit FC tag that had been thrown on Burnley, which which kind of did feel a little bit unfair because it wasn't a deliberate, you know, um, what's the word, ploy from from, from the club. It isn't a tag that you particularly want. And, and, you know, we were a very white English club with and and I just think I just don't think that's a particularly good um, environment for an inclusive sport where everybody's welcome. So I was really pleased to see that. Um, we didn't start off that well in the championship. There was a, I remember the first game of the season, there was a lot of hilarious um, quips on social media, everybody trying to guess what the squad would be and who would play where, because we didn't know these players. We didn't know where they played. It was a bit of a guessing game, which was quite amusing, everybody having a joke with it. Um, and then we played Huddersfield away on the first game of the season. And, This episode is brought to you by Columbia Sportswear. It's snowing again, and that wind chill is killer. But you're not worried about that because you shop the Omni Heat Infinity Collection. It's warmth perfected with tiny gold dots that reflect your body heat inside and protect you from the cold outside. No snow or chilly temps can stop you now. Go out anyway. Shop the Omni Heat Infinity Collection now at Columbia.com slash infinity. Are you that person who has everything? The coolest merch and those must-have fan threads? Well, over at our Anfield Index shop, we've gone that extra mile when it comes to pimping up your Liverpool collection. From our popular range of bespoke design t-shirts, sweaters, hoodies and hats, to our signature edition mugs, prints and coasters, all provided with fast worldwide shipping. We have something for every red. We also stock official LFC merchandise, and are licensed with the Premier League and UEFA to sell official iron-on shirt badges and sleeve patches. As a listener to this podcast, you can get 10% off everything with coupon code AIPRO10. Just head over to anfieldindex.shop or find us on Etsy by searching for Anfield Index. For 90 minutes, Burnley fans just stood aghast with their mouths open, unable to comprehend what they were seeing. It was attacking, fast-paced, exciting, modern football, using every winger in the world. We'd gone from having one winger in Dwight McNeil for about 45 years to now having an entire squad made up of young, tricky Belgian wingers. So I think that's quite a shift in terms of playing style. Um We then had a, so it was all very exciting. It was like, my goodness, this is, we'd forgotten what it was like to enjoy our football. Um, And then we had a little bit of tricky first eight or nine games and that we kept being a little bit naive, and which is ironic given where we are this season, and just conceding last minute equalisers. And we drew about eight or nine games on the bounce. And then suddenly everything clicked. Um, Now, you've got to bear in mind, it was 16 new players that came in in the summer. The entire Dyche year, apart from maybe three players, went. Um, We beat our local rivals, Blackburn, at home on the penultimate game in December when we all before we all finished for the World Cup. And that took us top of the league. And that's that's the first weekend of December. So what is it? Fourth of December. We didn't lose the top spot again the rest of the season. That's how dominant we were. We finished the season on over 100 points. I'm sorry, I have to mention this because I don't think I'll ever tire of saying this. We won the league at Ewood, which is, how like, how amazing is that? To win the title, it's the equivalent of you guys winning at Old Trafford, I think. Like winning the title at Old Trafford. Can you imagine the, the gods setting that up for you? It was just incredible. Yeah. Um, and last season was just amazing. It was, it was everything we'd forgotten that we knew we loved about football. And it was a really important season for us and it was the best season we've had in a very long time. And I think everybody, the board, the fans, everybody connected with the club needed that season, that exciting release. So it was really good. We all expected... Yeah, Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I I was going to say that, I mean, you cover a lot there in terms of obviously sort of the sort of the perception of the club, the way in which you you were sort of keen for it to evolve, company, uh, who I've I've seen, obviously... always be judged on his his work on the pitch but I've seen him obviously talk incredibly impressively yeah. off the pitch as well when confronted with those kind of questions but when, when there's been incidents and matches 
Um, you know, things like he's, I think he's spoken really, really well. So I think it's um, like as a symbol of the club moving to a completely different or moving in a completely different direction. I think that's that's been really clear. And I, I was going to ask, I mean, just like you, you mentioned, obviously, sort of the, the the dream scenario of winning promotion uh, at Blackburn. And, and just a question I'd say is, I mean, oh, sorry, at Middlesbrough rather, but in, in terms of the um, like end of the season, when you were looking at the squad and thinking, okay, we've yeah, we've we've molded the squad in a different, a completely different direction. We've got a side that's playing football that's yeah, very different to how we played when we were last in the Premier League. I want to ask you sort of when you, uh, how well suited you, how well suited you thought the squad was, and 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 so sort of what areas you thought we're going to need to reinforce these if we if we got a chance to sort of actually cement ourselves back into the uh, into the Premier League. So this is in the summer, sorry. Yeah, in the summer. Yeah, yeah. I think we were we were we were relatively positive. I think I never believed the hype that was going around. People saying, "Oh, Burnley will easily." you know, comfortably stay up, they'll finish ninth, tenth, you know, they'll be top side. This is a new era. I never really believed that, but I also did not expect us to be in the appalling state that we are now. I didn't expect it to be this bad. I really didn't. That's taken me by surprise. I think my first sort of slight concern was our um recruitment in the summer. Um I think we all ex- there were three loan players who we had last season Taylor Harwood Bellis so a full uh, centre half from Manchester City Ian Matson, the Chelsea left back and Nathan Teller the Southampton striker who were all incredibly important players for us last season in the championship and we fully expected that all three of those would come back and that was the message that we were getting um, was that all three of them would come back um, and just sign for us and all of them you know why wouldn't they you know Matson was the only one who was at a pr- proper Premier League club um obviously Taylor Howard Bellis was at City but he was never going to get into the first team and we didn't think Matson would either Teller was the one we thought we might struggle with because South but Southampton got relegated so we thought well this is going to be great and all three of them it never happened Teller wanted to come to us we wanted to sign him but Southampton wanted 19 million for him we valued him at 15 and we wouldn't pay more so he's gone abroad for yeah. some reason it never happened with Taylor Harwood Bellis and Matson. we agreed a deal with Chelsea agreed personal terms all good and at eight o'clock on transfer deadline day and we were expecting to turn up at the turf and he never did and he had he, he, him himself as an individual decided he wasn't coming um so there's nothing you can do about that that's you know he's burned his bridges there that's done um so it left us without a left back which is in a, uh, luckily for us charlie taylor's doing a fantastic job but he doesn't quite he's trying his best and i've got a lot of respect for charlie taylor this season i think he's doing an incredible job under the circumstances and i'm I think he can hold his head up very, very high. He's He knows he's not the first choice. He got dropped last season in the championship and came off the bench. He knew he wasn't going to be first choice this season. And when we failed to secure Nathan Teller before the season even started, Vincent Company turned around and said, we will be rectifying the left-back season in January, uh, left-back posi- problem in January. How does that make Charlie Taylor feel? And then he's been asked to start every single game in the first half, knowing he's going to get binned in January. And he's come out and he's played so well and he's worked so hard. And the level of professionalism to me has just given me a massive amount of respect for him. Um, Luckily for us, uh, well, luckily for us, Lyle Foster's been an absolute revelation. Unfortunately, he is poorly at the moment, so we do need to be very careful with him. Um, And we just got other fullbacks. But we ended up with Dara O'Shea instead of Taylor Harwood Bellis, who just isn't ready yet whether he ever will be ready for the Premier League I do not know but he's not yet performing to the level that he needs to be doing um so the recruitment set me a little bit concerned and I think how we've started this season has been a combination it's it's been just so disjointed Vincent Company started the first eight and nine games doing the pet roulette doing the tweaking which is just shocking um we never know who was going to play there was players coming in and out of the squad it wasn't settled particularly the back four it was a different defense every single week and he was just tinkering every single game with the same disastrous results um we've lost Lyle Foster and Luke Collio short to injury and, and, and illness so that's been disappointing but you know that you can't can't do anything with that but I think the biggest problem for me is that Vincent Company is is he is prioritizing philosophy over results he is he is more he is he is happier he appears happier to be relegated on record number of points but still keep his philosophy intact that he will play expansive exciting football that is brilliant to watch 
rather than do the ugly, the dirty, the Sean Dyche style football, which is horrendously unattractive, I would add, but is necessary to survive and just get us to survive in this league. And I, I, I don't understand that at all. Um, so I think it's I think it's been a difficult start to company, but I don't think I, I, I don't I think I think the club's already waved the white flag and we're just going to go straight back down um, without mm. much of a fight, which feels very disappointing. I didn't expect it to be this bad. I didn't expect I knew it would be a struggle, but I thought we'd finish fifteenth, sixteenth. But we're going to go the, all three promoted sides are going to go straight back down. I think, which is disappointing. Mm. Yeah, I sort of understand his stance from from one perspective. Right? I mean, we're talking about sort of the the desire to transform the club and sort of take it into a different direction. So you, I can I can understand why you, you don't you don't want to abandon that philosophy and go okay, uh, this this doesn't work. Let's go back to what did work uh, like entirely. But I, I I know what you're saying there. I mean, there's a, there's a time for pragmatism and getting points on the board and yeah, then giving yourself a chance to yeah, actually yeah, reinforce the side and okay, yeah. if you want to play if you want to play in a certain way try and get back to that but i yeah i do i'm i'm, I'm torn between I mean, we see so many system managers don't we in the premier league who just who do just like strictly adhere to their sort of style of play um yeah. usually they've got all the money to back back them up when they do when they do it but um yeah well, we spent we spent 100 million in the summer that you did i was I mean, gonna say there's a lot of players yeah. I, i'm not i'm not an idiot i know full well that that hello I'm here to annoy you. I'm here to annoy you into listening to more of me and more of others on EPL Index. We don't just have the Anfield Index stuff. We've got EPL Index as well, which covers the entirety of the Premier League. And we have three podcasts and a whole bunch of really good writing on EPLindex.com. The podcasts are my own two-footed podcast, which is every day at 4 p.m., Monday through Friday, covering the whole league. We have a tad predictable hosted by Tadiwa. You know Tadiwa, he does Anfield Index. He presents a tad predictable before every Premier League match week. And then Kevin DeVries and his crew on the EPL Roundtable there every week after the Premier League match week. So make sure you listen to everything we're doing on EPL Index and follow us there on Twitter at EPL Index. Thank you. Bye bye. Spending that amount of money doesn't guarantee you um, success. And actually, the way that things have gone now, that probably only gets you maybe a, a, a you know a bottom side side. You know, it, it doesn't it doesn't guarantee it. It means it's an awful lot for us, but it doesn't necessarily. The holidays start here at Kroger with a variety of options to celebrate traditions, old and new. You could do a classic herb roasted turkey or spice it up and make turkey tacos. Serve up a go-to shrimp cocktail or use Simple Truth wild caught shrimp for your first Cajun risotto. Make creamy mac and cheese or a spinach artichoke fondue from our selection of Murray's cheese. No matter how you shop, Kroger has all the freshest ingredients to embrace all your holiday traditions. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Give us definite chances of survival, but yeah, I agree with you. It's like you can't have your cake and eat it, can you? Like we were so ready for the end of the Daesh era because it was just so painful to watch and it was so stale and archaic and difficult and, and Daesh was kind of run out of it a little bit and the players were tired and it just needed a refresh and it just felt like the right time. So I don't want to go back to that. I want the – oh, gosh, this is – I know what I want. I want the season we had last time where we run all over a league and play this incredible, exciting football and win every game, but I want them in the Premier League. But you can't have that in the Premier League because you're not Manchester City. It's difficult. Yeah. It's very that's difficult. <laughs> that's, that's that's the problem. Manchester We're not right. Manchester City. That's the problem. There we are. And here we here we have in the yeah. space of 20 minutes, um, we have solved the problem of Burnley Football Club this season. Well done, us. Well done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You got the Manchester City captain, legend, leader, legend, etc. But yeah, not, not who weirdly not, is terrible in defence as a manager, which just really confuses me. Like he's one of the greatest centre halves ever, and he cannot like our defence is so so bad, so bad. So I'm like, mm. what is going on here? Anyway, sorry. That is it is, it's, it's it's always interesting when you see that. To be honest, yeah, like it's like. This this next crop of managers that are coming through at the moment from sort of the players that we've watched and like I'm 
keeping one eye on on Xabi Alonso in the Bundesliga, who's uh, obviously doing very, very well. I think they're currently undefeated. And are they top of the league? Somewhere, somewhere near about. So it's um, yeah, I've got one eye on that. But you look at certain players, and they don't. To your point, they don't necessarily play the football that you'd expect them to, given sort of their their own careers. So... It's like you just have to separate the player from from the manager, I guess. And uh, are there specific games this season that you could point to um, where you go, well, that, that pretty much encapsulates the, the difficulties we've had this season. Like, or are, are there games that yeah, everyone, also, no, <laughs> every, every single one. <laughs> uh, well, to be fair, Everton at the weekend, I mean, it, it, that's probably an easy one to say because it's yeah, fresh yeah. in my mind, but I think that to me really epitomized everything. It probably brought it more into focus because it was our ex manager. Um, but, We'd started to show some starts, some signs. For about three or four games, companies stuck with the same team and we were getting some stability in terms of players and that made a difference. And I think, you know, we lost against West Ham, but it was a hugely improved performance. And then away at Brighton, we got a fantastic point. We had that brilliant 5-0 win at home against Sheffield United. So everything felt very... It felt like, OK, we might not survive this season, but I am starting to see signs that lessons are being learned and improvements are being made. So that's a good thing. That's what that's what I want now from the season. We're not going to survive. There's no way we can. We're already seven points adrift. This is, and we are so far behind in terms of standard of the rest of the, the, the league. Even the teams that were supposed to be our relegation rivals. So let's look at Bournemouth Forest. I have to probably put Palace in there as well. I think they've got some troubles. Um, they are they're absolutely annihilating us in games. I, okay, no, maybe not Forest. We drew away with them, but but they're so much better than we are. You know, Palace came to Turf more with no intention of winning. Probably the worst side I've seen play at Turf this season. No, actually, that's not fair. Sheffield United were she, uh, second worst of the established, yeah. definitely the worst of the of the. Uh, established Premier League size and we just gifted them two goals and they won easily without having to lift a finger and they're in, they're really struggling now they are so much more confident than we are um, so I think I'm trying to find out so I think with the Everton game that's what, sorry that's where I was going with that digressed slightly um, I started to see pockets and I was feeling relatively comfortable and the mistakes and the naivety that company and his side showed in that Everton game they were criminal against any Premier League side but to, to, to lose and in set pieces against a Sean Dyche side, you know that's how he's going to play. That's how he always plays. You know he's strong at set pieces. Like, goodness me, come on, people. Like, this is silly. Um, so I think that that to me showed a a real um, fragility in terms of mental strength, but also uh, a fragility in terms of tactics. So that was particularly disappointing, I think. Yeah, no. If, if I'm putting myself in company's shoes, I am doing everything I possibly can to prep the squad that we are not losing to this man. <laughs> like, like, I'm not, yeah. I'm not, letting, I'm not letting these optics come back to, <laughs> come back yeah, to get I, me. Right. I, I think that's true, and I think, I mean, Dash himself says that he isn't, he's not that, he's sentimental, and I, and I, I do believe that because I've, you know, I've had ten years of him being very hard nosed and very <laughs> like I, I I do believe that if there's one guy I do believe that that's the case. But I think what I would say is that I was really pleased for Daesh, as much as it hurt that we lost in the way that we did, from a human from a humanity level, I was really pleased that Daesh is Daesh's first game back at turf was when he was in a position of being confident and doing well with his side. He had a difficult season last season. The fans didn't warm to him at all. He had a difficult start to this season as well. He was gifted some absolutely fantastically soft opening fixtures and started to lose a lot of them. So he was under pressure. And a lot of people were talking about him being the first manager to be sacked. Um, if he'd have been in that position and come into turf more under pressure with fans booing him and fan, his own fans against him and, you know, in danger of losing his job, that would have been really awful for him to come to his old employer he'd just been sacked from on the verge of being sacked by his new employer. And just at a basic humanity level, I would have that would have broken my heart because he's a fundamentally nice guy that deserved better than that. So even though the Beatles, I was really pleased that he could come to turf more, hold his head up, walk onto the pitch and take the applause from the Burnley. And he got such a warm reception from the Burnley fans, such a warm reception. They loved him. And I, to see him walk onto that pitch with the Everton fans proud that he was their manager and the Burnley fans proud that he was doing well and that we'd been proven right, that, look, this guy is a good manager, bear with him. He has funny ways and he is a funny thing and he's quite 
old fashioned and rigid in his ways, but he'll get results. And so that was nice. That was just that was a nice moment for me. I, I think he earned that right to hold his head up high. So I was pleased for that. Sean dies the Maverick, but he gets he, he gets results. Got his soul yeah. is, soul <laughs> I've got to say though, obviously in the build up to the Everton game. He obviously there was a lot of attention on him because he was coming back to turf. So I had to listen to a lot of his press conferences because it was our game. And I love the man, but my goodness me, I do not miss those press conferences. I don't miss the rubbish yeah. he comes out with. Bless I his don't heart. think he's I don't <laughs> think he's gonna he's not gonna be releasing any audiobooks, no, I think, anytime anytime not. soon. Bless I think him. Bless um, you mentioned there just a little bit, I mean, obviously about the, the club waving the white flag and almost accepting that, that there's yeah, that they're gonna go down in some senses. Um, do you get the impression, I mean, like your company has been you know, quite confident, okay, I'm sticking to this philosophy, you know, irrespective of the, of the results. I, uh, how do you feel about the, the security of his position? Let's say, you, you know, you, things do continue on this trend. Yeah, it's, all, it's all well and good him having that view of I'm going to stick with my principles and my philosophy, but do you, do you get the sense that the club is on board with oh, that as well? Yeah, absolutely. There is no way on this okay. planet okay. that this board is hacking him. There's just no way. We could go down... We could go down with like breaking Derby's points, and um, okay. they won't sack him. They just absolutely won't. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah. Just, I think it's, in some senses I, that makes that makes the uh, the forward planning easier, doesn't it? If you if, if you sort of know that, the, that this manager is going to be stuck in place regardless. Um, I mean, I was just, just thinking about Steve Cooper and his his sacking recently. Obviously, gosh, that's an odd situation, that isn't it? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't understand it. Yeah, I, I don't understand it at all. Um, yeah, I'm not sure uh, if he's been appointed yet, but was it Nuno Espirito Santo? Not, not the most inspiring of. Uh, yeah, and also as well, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. <laughs> this is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac, and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, mag boxes, and games consoles. Visit LibertyShield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't get that. I don't, I just, yeah. But anyway, listen, that's, who are we to judge? It's, uh, it's down to yeah. Forest to see what they want to do. But yeah, it's definitely, um, that's a definite, definite one. I, I, I think, yeah, the, the board are absolutely um, on board with company being in, in charge. And obviously there's a, there's a really obvious point here that, Vincent Company is an absolute cheat code when it comes to um, champion winning championship football. So you'd think that he's best placed to bring us up next year. I guess my question mark then becomes: if we do go down, keep hold of Company, come back up again, and he obviously runs away with the championship again, and we we do all of that again, then we're back in the Premier League. What's different to where we are now? Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like yeah, how. Yeah. How do we ensure that um, we're not in exactly the same place this just... time next year? Like, because company is not ready for the, he is not ready at all for the Premier League. He just is not. That's that's very clear. Um, so how do we then ensure that when he does come back in, he is ready? Because yeah. if he goes down, that that would be my question. Now I'm pretty clear with this in that. I think one of the reasons that the board can't sack the company is that you can't, if you're going to hire a manager with absolutely no Premier League experience whatsoever, to me, you can't 
sack that manager when in their inaugural Premier League campaign, they don't know what they're doing and it doesn't go very well. To me, you don't hire that one in the first, you don't hire that manager in the first place. Does that make sense? I don't know if that's maybe too naive a view. Um, no, it makes sense. But I think, I, I just think you can't, um, yeah, you can't, you can't have your cake and eat it that way. It's like you, you either, you, you know, you've got to give, if you're going to get an upcoming manager with no experience, you've got to give them that chance. Yeah, I think so there. And I think in in that case, I'm mean, conscious that these, uh, these pods that we're doing around this time of year, like trying to keep them brief, just given how many many fixtures there are crammed into a small um, space of time. I mean, there, w- there would have been a time, you know, naturally, of course, you know, going to Turf more on Boxing Day, um, there, there can be sort of an uncomfortable situation. I mean, what kind of game are you expecting then you know, if, if, uh, if Liverpool... Uh, rock up um, on on Boxing Day. I mean, like, uh, how has company generally approached these games against like the sides, I suppose, traditionally in the in the top six? Uh, terribly. I mean, I, uh, I mean, okay. it, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. This is. I think this is one of the problems. He doesn't necessarily seem to um, change the strategy depending on who is playing. He treats playing City as he would do treating. Um, you know, Sheffield United at home or Luton away. So he will play exactly the same player. And that's that's kind of frustrating from a fan perspective because he's still going to want to play a very high line. He's going to want to attack. He's going to want to try and play out from the back. He's going to instruct his defence to pass out and be comfortable passing in their own box, even though you've got Mo Salah about to jump down on you and score goals. Liverpool could, if they don't, like, wind it in a bit, could score double figures. Like, do you know what I mean? It's like, I genuinely oh, believe wow. at some point this season we will get beat by double figures. Like we've had a couple, we've we've conceded so many goals. Just and also as well, when these goals go in, these these players go in. Uh, sorry, the, the defense when the, when these goals go in, mentally we don't seem to be particularly very strong. And these, um, we then start conceding like six or seven. That that tends to be what happens, and it's. Yeah, so I, I, I've kind of lost the um, any faith this season. I think I think you know we're going to go down. It's it's no it's no great surprise um, that you know we're not going to we're not going to survive this season. But what I want to see now is a manager who's starting to learn his lessons. Yeah. that's what I think has to happen. This is what I was going to ask, actually. Yeah, between now and at the end of the season, if uh, if you're already sort of somewhat resigned to going down, I mean, like, what are the most important things you're looking to see from company that, like, a tr- trying to adapt the tactics, trying to find a way to be a bit, a bit more like solid in these games, or actually find a way to grind out results? Is that is is that what you're looking for? I mean, I'm, I'm, what would be what would be the most important things you could see between now and the, now and the end of yeah, the season? Yeah, I, I think I think I want I think the only thing that I, I need to see now is I need to see um, <clears throat> a commitment to improving what we've got, a commitment to learning from mistakes. Um, I, I don't. I don't think we should be spending a lot of money in January. I think a fruit. I think it's a fruitless effort to try and stay in this league. Um, I wouldn't be wasting any more money. I think we need to just prepare the squad for who's going in the summer when we go back down and who um, who is best placed to keep us in the championship. I certainly wouldn't be giving him another hundred million to spend on players because I just don't think I think that's a fruitless effort this season. So I think what I want to see this season is um, the penny starting to drop. That's what I want to see. I want to see some mistakes being rectified and I want to see people um, learning how to survive in this league. I, well, think, yeah. I think we have to think about the future because we ain't going to survive this year. Well, I mean, I hope that's been somewhat cathartic. I mean, it, 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 it sounds like you've already made your peace with it, to be honest. And, um, <laughs> I have. This has been it, a really great session. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And, and to be honest, I mean, like, if, yeah, if I was in your position as well, part of me would be like, uh, well, yeah, I would quite like to go down again so we just win the, cha- win the championship again because yeah, that's, yeah, like, be that's, that's, great, that's really, really fun to, to like, <laughs> yeah. slaughter people. Like, yeah. in the, and I don't so, miss, uh, oh, my goodness, and it's so good not having VAR in the championship. I cannot tell you how much, how great it is having a are season. They not, 
Are they not introducing it? Is that not no, going to... No, 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 okay, no one okay. Yeah, they've not got the money in the championship. And honestly, it's, it's delightful. It, yeah, decisions go against you, but decisions go for you. And it's just everybody's in the same position. But you know what? I'll leave you with this note. The utter okay. joy of scoring a goal, a quick glance at the liner, the flag's down, and you can just celebrate. You can yeah. go nuts. You can, you can remember what it's like, the sheer unadulterated joy of celebrating a goal I don't celebrate, you don't celebrate goals in the Premier League. You stand up, go yes, and then you wait for the AR. And it's just sucks the soul out of live football. I was going to say, I think that's the reason why I think some of the uh, Sobosh lies like thunder bastards this season. Those are the, the only ones now sort of left where you can go, well, you definitely can't <laughs> take that away. <laughs> like like for, for 30 yards. Yeah. To the top corner, you go, right, I think that's uh, I think that's safe. But anyway, I think, that's yeah, there's very few ones. <laughs> There's very few left, honestly. Yeah, it's, it has definitely diluted the enjoyment. But um, Natalie, I want, to really, I want to really thank you for coming on, especially this time of year. I know it's hard. It's, it's hard to get these, uh, My pleasure. these pods together. You know it uh, uh, just as well as me. So um, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Best of luck, everybody. Absolutely. And just quickly before we wrap up, just say to all those who are listening into the the, the positive season, there'll be another rival week on. Uh, ahead of the uh, next game, which is the first of January, twenty twenty four, Liverpool. Uh, welcoming Newcastle to Anfield. So yeah, do stay tuned for another episode ahead of that fixture on the first day of the new year. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds, and it means the world to the people who create these free shows. Sports Social Podcast Network.